Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford, joined as always by my trusted colleague, Weston Hodkowitz. We're coming to you from different locations here at Lambeau Field. And Wes, the last show that we did, there was only one training camp practice in the books. There are now five training camp practices done and over with, including the first one in pads, albeit only shoulder pads. The uh, The full pads will go on uh, for Tuesday's practice. But the initial impressions, um, what everybody's asking, asking us about, Wes, is, okay, so how's Jordan Love looking? How do things look? So your early impressions through five practices of Jordan Love as QB1. I thought he stacked days on Saturday and on Monday. I, I thought Saturday was one of his better practices. I mean, there was some folks out there that were wondering if it was his best practice. I'm guessing those folks weren't there in 2021 during the mini camp or whatever that was on June 9th, where I thought it looked like we were looking at Joe Montana for a couple seconds with some of the throws he made. But the, the fact of the matter is, I think you're seeing a young guy grow with confidence and, and his ability to deliver the football. What was interesting about Monday's practice, though, Mike, and I'm currently in the middle at the time that we're taping this in the middle of our writing our five things story was some of the can plays and some of the audibles that he made the pre snap adjustments in that team period against the defense. And one of them, one of the biggest plays of camp actually came off of a can play, and that was. Uh, this man beater that they ran to to Christian Watson, kind of sensing they were getting man defense from the Packers unit. Uh, Christian Watson ended up singled up against Innes Gaines, and Innes is a fine player, but with no safety help over the top and a guy with four three seven speed, I mean that the rest of the equation kind of solves itself. And, and certainly, Jordan Love put the ball exactly where it needed to be. I think you've seen both Love and Watson really grow in their chemistry and relationship this off season and just the, the way in which he's kind of managing the line of scrimmage. Another play that I'm kind of isolating was the RPO that he ran on that quick inside slant to Watson during a uh, period actually before that play uh, when he was matched up against Jerry Alexander and he found something he liked, he made the check and then Watson was on the same page. It's one thing to throw a ball. It's one thing to run the scheme and the play call as it's called in. It's another thing to be able to start to manipulate and take advantage of what the defense is giving you. And I felt like Monday in particular, uh, Love showed a lot of those signs. Yeah, the first couple of practices, as I mentioned on our last show, you always expect the defense to be ahead in the early going. And I think that showed the offense, Jordan Love, trying to get their footing a little bit. And we saw the offense bust out a little bit on Saturday. Uh, I really thought, even though there was maybe only the one like wow play with uh, the the sideline shot to Samari Toure that was in the two minute drill toward the end of practice, fantastic route and throw and catch, a uh, really big highlight there. But what really stood out about Saturday was just the efficiency, the way Love was operating the offense. Matt Lafleur even commented on just the the smoothness of the operation of the two minute drill. So you can see that the progress is being made. It wasn't as efficient today than on Monday when the shoulder pads went on. But I agree with you that the uh, what we saw on Monday were were those adjustments, the choices, the decisions that were being made because. Hey, and as you said, no disrespect to Innis Gaines. This is a safety. The Packers are trying him out at nickel corner in some of the, the sub packages um, defensively. So he's he's trying to learn a new spot. And the Packers offense happened to get in a position where Watson was in the slot and Innis Gaines was lined up across from him, essentially one-on-one. -on -one. Well, yeah, that's almost a no-brainer. Like Jordan Love and Christian Watson are looking at each other and they know exactly what needs to be done on that play. They executed it. Deep ball down the field works. And uh and yeah, I don't I don't care if it's Jair Alexander lined up across from Watson. If he's on the backside slant of an RPO and that's one on one, I like his size to win the matchup there. Jordan Love did too. He pulled the ball back. Instead of the handoff on uh, on the RPO, hit Watson on uh, on the slant. Those are the types of things. Those are the plays that move the chains. Those are the things that get some momentum going for the offense. I think uh, I think we saw that, and now uh, you know we'd like to continue to see that moving forward as the Packers will have a couple more padded practices this week before then family night under the lights on Saturday night at Lambeau. Well, the, the big key for Green Bay right now is going into the two minute, right? Because I think when you've seen some of the scripted periods, those those team periods, 
things have actually gone pretty well for Green Bay and the offense as of late. It's been the two minute where they kind of had some hiccups. Monday was another one of those circumstances, the defense holding the Packers offense at bay in all three units. And actually with the ones, Quay Walker was this close from picking off love across the middle on the very first play of the drive. Uh, And honestly, I'm sure that's one we didn't talk to Quay, but I'm sure he'd love to have that one back because it was right in his mitts. And you have to be able to react to that. You have to be able to grow from it. But when you look at the plays that Watson has made, that Jaden Reed has made these these last couple of days, uh, as you mentioned, Samori's catch on Saturday, 33 yards on third and three down the sideline. I don't think Jordan Love could have physically thrown a better ball on that play. Uh, the, the big play and the explosiveness is there. It's about managing the certain situations I think is going to be critical for this offense moving forward because it is about protection. Uh, And it's funny, as much as I mentioned the Quay Walker play, Love actually has done an exemplary job of protecting the football. There's really one interception, the Devondre Campbell pick last week that I can think of with the first team unit. Obviously, Carrington Valentine picked off Danny Etling during practice on Monday, but by and large, Green Bay has done a good job of taking care of the football, but it's those type of bang, bang decisions that you throw a pick on the first play of a two minute series. It turns everything on its head. Yeah, absolutely. Walker should have had that pick and and the defense did ultimately still win the drive and has won the vast majority of the two minute drills, I think. And we were standing quite a ways away. I think Romeo Dobbs lost his footing on the crossing route there on uh, on the ball that that Walker should have picked off, but not uh, not getting a super close look at it. Um, not entirely sure what happened. That's a thin that margin, one, but, though, right, though, Mike? Yeah, I mean, that's a thin 100%. margin. Yeah, you know? 100%. Well, you mentioned a guy, and I want to talk a little bit more about him as well as a couple others. The The uh, impressions that the rookies are making in the early stages of training camp, there are two that jump out to me more than anybody else, and it's Jaden Reed on the offensive side, and it's Carrington Valentine on the defensive side. Reed, the second-round draft yep. pick out of Michigan State playing uh, slot receiver, seems to come up with a play, a big play in some form or fashion, just about every day in practice. The ball seems to find this young man when he's out there on the field. That is definitely something to watch going forward. And Carrington Valentine, the seventh-round pick, um, just 21 years old. I actually looked it up. He's going to turn 22, West, the day before the season opener in Chicago. Oh, good. Um, I won't feel this, so old. Yeah, this young man, I, we we talked about him dur- during OTAs where, you know, he – sort of by default had moved up the depth chart because Alexander and Douglas were not at OTAs. Eric Stokes was still doing, you know, rehab and whatnot. And, you know, when he was lining up across from Dobbs and some of these other guys in OTAs, he wasn't backing down. I thought he he showed some tenacity. He showed some spunk and, uh, and it's carried over to the start of training camp. And, and uh, as far as that, strong start it was sort of capped if you will by uh by a pick six off a throw by Danny Etling in practice on Monday and uh and the defense celebrated like crazy like you would uh you would imagine they were pretty fired up to see that rookie seventh round pick from Kentucky make a big play yeah it's the three s's for me Mike I mean you when you look at it it's speed size and swagger I feel like Valentine has all three of those and we saw it in the offseason program you and I did some of these these um, unscripted talking about, you know, him stepping up and competing, competing against Romeo Dobbs. It wasn't like he's just going up against some undrafted guys trying to, you know, be bubble guys and going up against the top guys on this team, especially when Jair and, and Rasul weren't here. So I, I thought he's made some really nice plays. I think Corey Ballantine has also competed as well. I mean, the, the Packers are showing the depth of that position beyond those top three or four guys. And, and certainly Valentine, a guy again, that I think everybody had a certain level of expectation for coming to Green Bay, just given how much praise, you know, Mel Kuyper had thrown at him. A lot of these things we'd heard about his upside relative to, you know, just having a, a pick, I think maybe at Kentucky, maybe didn't have the the, the jaw dropping numbers that people want uh, from, from elite prospects. But I, I just, I've really enjoyed what I've seen from him. And if I may just quickly with Jaden Reed, yeah. we've talked so much about the explosivity of his game, Mike, but I think what has impressed me the most through the first week of training camps is his smarts. And you're hearing more and more guys talk about this in the locker room, his knowledge of the route tree, his knowledge of knowing where he needs to be on the field. That's kind of the intangible for a young receiver coming in and playing right off the bat. You can have all the speed in the world and athleticism in the world, 
But if you don't understand how you fit into the construct of the offense, it's going to be a long, a long year for you. And I think the more and more we watch Reed and the ways that Green Bay could potentially use him, the more excited you get about where he could potentially fit in Matt LaFleur's scheme. Yeah, it's certainly looking like Jaden Reed is going to have a big role to play in this offense as a rookie, as the slot receiver. He's uh, he's picked things up very quickly. I think the smarts, as you just mentioned, have a lot to do with that. And uh, there was a great one-on-one rep to uh, Monday in practice was the uh, was the first day of the one-on-ones because it was the first day that the pads were on I know you were watching the uh, the O-line and D-line I was watching the pass catchers against the DBs and there was a great one-on-one rep between Reed and Valentine these two guys that were talking about two rookies from this draft class and um, you know kind of a seam route down uh, you know down the hash and Valentine is running right with Reed. He's right there. And Etling's throw a, a little bit underthrown, but the ball was on him. And, you know, Reed just made the better adjustment in order to in order to make the catch contested catches. The two guys went crashing to the ground. The coverage was right where you want it. Valentine said afterward, the only thing he needed to do was just get his head turned around just a, you know, a tick quicker, a split yeah. second quicker. And, and maybe he comes down with that ball instead of Reed. But those kinds of competitive reps, man, I mean, you can't you can't ask for anything better to 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 get your rookies acclimated to see these guys in in the intensity that it takes to to practice and to play at this level and they were doing it and and to me um those are the those are the two rookies from this draft class that have that have stood out the most so far in terms of what we've seen on the practice field yeah and if i may and i don't know if you want to dovetail into this at all but just looking at the one-on-ones with the pads going on us seeing that both the receivers and the in the db's the offensive line and defensive line and a little bit I was able to watch with the blitz pickup between the linebackers and running backs, but it's always the most fun for me as a spectator and as observer of football is watching those drills because one, it's a little bit more simple. We understand that it's one-on-one you're seeing Mm -hmm. two guys clash and one's going to appear to be victorious. Although they always talk about the different things that both of these guys are working on, but two, it starts to give you an idea of what, these offensive linemen and defensive linemen are going to look like in pads. And I personally came away very impressed with Zach Tom. He took the first two reps at right tackle going up against Lucas Van S and Van S tried to spin move on him and then tried to bull rush him. Tom stood up to both of those techniques, techniques, kept his balance. He mentioned in the locker room afterwards, you know, he put on 15 pounds this off season, wanting to be better prepared to anchor at that spot. I think he's right in the middle of that competition with Yash Nyman at right tackle. But also just quickly, TJ Slayton probably had the rep of the day being able to to kind of get through Josh Myers at the center position. Devontae Wyatt had a really nice first rep against John Runyon. Jake Hansen being able to block Jonathan Ford on back-to-back plays at center. And probably the guy that I think we're going to continue to hear a lot about is Caleb Jones, Mike. And Caleb Jones repped at both right tackle and then also left tackle during the one-on-ones. Six foot nine. 340 pounds or whatever he's going at after, you know, the weight loss, he is about as athletic as a guys you're going to find at that size. I mean, I, I said it to you last year, Mike, in some ways, he almost reminded me like of a basketball player just with his footwork and his ability and his length to keep guys away from his body. I mean, you get the footwork down on the pad level de- down, you're in the hunt, man. And I think Caleb Jones, since the day he got to green Bay has put himself in a position to really compete here with this really deep offensive line. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to watch throughout the rest of this training camp and the preseason games moving forward because it sure looks like Caleb Jones is on almost the exact same track that Yash Nyman was on a few years ago. An undrafted guy, not a whole lot of fanfare coming out, but the guy that it, as soon as you lay eyes on him, you're like, oh yeah, that looks like an NFL offensive lineman, right? So there, there are the physical tools that are there from the beginning, but nobody, nobody willing to to spend a draft pick. And the Packers, they they like to develop these guys. Yeah. Yash Nyman's become a multi year starter now, and he's in a competition with uh now with a draft pick in Zach Tom for for a starting spot at tackle. But Caleb Jones is is kind of right where Yash Nyman was a, a couple of years ago, and uh, the Packers are going to continue to 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 develop talent like that and and see what happens. And do I expect Caleb Jones to be a starter week one in twenty twenty three? No, but 
it's looking like he could be one of these, you know, next men up, uh, you know, if, if uh, he needs to be called upon. And uh, that's exactly how Yash Nyman got uh, started a couple years back. Yeah. And in some ways, Mike, he's even ahead of Yash, right? Because when you look at Yash, he got that whole 2019 season on the practice squad. Caleb was there for a month. And then the Packers got to the end of September. We're like, we got to get this guy on the 53. He did have an illness there that kind of kept him out for a time, but he was on the active roster the rest of the way. And certainly, uh, again, I'll just quickly talk about the feet with him. I mean, people, when you see Caleb Jones in person, you're going to be impressed by the physical stature. You're going to be impressed by just how he looks in pads, but watch his feet. I, the guy for a guy that was not drafted played at Indiana, you know, didn't really have a lot of hype behind him coming out. I've just, I've been so impressed by his nimbleness. And I thought when you look at the one-on-one drills, especially if you don't get your pad level down and you're six foot nine, you're going to end up on your butt really fast. And, <laughs> and this guy knows his body and much like Yash, I, I think understanding, okay, I'm six, nine, six, seven. How can I use that to my strength and in, in being able to defeat the, you know, opposing defensive lineman across from me? Yeah. Well, um, before we get to a couple other topics, I do need to take care of some sponsor business here, Wes. So Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl, Cousin Subs, 50 years of better. <laughs> All right, well, to update some folks with regard to the depth chart, we mentioned the competition going on at right tackle between Zach Tom and Yash Nyman. Zach Tom definitely taking more of the first team reps at right tackle, but it comes with a caveat in terms of understanding just where things are with the competition because David Bakhtiari is kind of on a part-time schedule with regard to practicing. He's not practicing full-time. There are some days he's missing entirely. Other times he's being rotated out. The Packers being very careful, just knowing what they have in Bakhtiari. He knows what he needs to get ready for the season. And this far in front of the season opener, he doesn't need to be out there taking 40 or 50 snaps um, in a given practice. So Yash Nyman has been taking a lot of first team offensive line reps at left tackle when David Bakhtiari is uh, is not in there. So not quite sure exactly where the competition is at right tackle right now, even though we're seeing Zach Tom there a lot more often. At safety on the defensive side, Rudy Ford definitely has taken the majority of the first team reps alongside Darnell Savage. We have seen other guys rotate in at different times, but Rudy Ford, at least through this uh, this first week of training camp, uh, remains the guy. And a lot of folks asking about Lucas Van Ness, the first round pick at outside linebacker. We have seen him rotate in here and there across from Preston Smith with the number one defense. But I would say the majority of the snaps with the number one defense, Justin Hollins, has been that out that edge rusher opposite Preston Smith. Would you agree with yeah. uh, that analysis? Yeah, th what they've been doing here is in the two minute, they've been giving Lucas Van Ness some opportunities to get involved there. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, especially once Rashawn Gary's back, you can think of how you can play with those guys. Whew. Fruit fly. Uh, you can play with those guys in those circumstances, things I don't typically have to deal with when we're in the studio, Mike, I'm sitting here having to play through it now and I'm doing the best that I can <laughs> with it. Um, but go back to 2019, right? That's how Rash Rashawn Gary got introduced to this defense was being in there in those passing down situations. Uh, you're right about Justin Hollins. He actually was in kind of a pretty even rotation as far as who was the starter with Kingsley and Igbari through the first few practices. But Hollins has a lot of that you know, experience and, and things to fall back on where I think an Igbari uh, probably ended up playing a little bit above expectations last year as a fifth round pick. And definitely during the second half of the year when they didn't have Rashawn Gary, it's a full room right now. And I think they're, you know, we saw that last week with Jonathan Garvin's release. I mean, they have some guys that I think they're pretty dedicated to, including, you know, now Cox coming in as an undrafted free agent could potentially factor into that as well. And, you know, also just quickly looking at, you know, the safety situation where that gets so interesting to me is Rudy Ford is still that number one option, but you know, he's also still working at flyer on special teams. All these guys have that, you know, duality to their game that they can also factor into special teams Innis Gaines is playing the slot, but he's also a jammer, but right. I mean, like 
it's going to be about who prevails in both of those avenues in terms of who makes this roster, but certainly you're still looking at who's going to be the best fit back there for Darnell Savage. And to this point, you know, it remains Jonathan Rudy Ford. Yeah. Um, you mentioned special teams. One last thing before we go, we've seen two kicking periods, field goal kicking periods in practice thus far. Anders, Anders Carlson, the rookie sixth round pick out of Auburn. He went five out of six from between 40 and 45 yards in the first one, then had a rough day on Saturday. He was one out of six on actually longer kicks. I want to say it was all from, you know, mid 45 and beyond or mid to late forties, um, 45 and beyond. And, and a couple of those were 50 plus and he was kicking into the wind a rough outing. He was only one out of six. Then he did finish with uh, uh, making the field goal to end a chip shot field goal to end the two minute drill um, for the offense. So two for seven uh, all together. Um, and Hey, it wasn't uh it wasn't a pretty kicking period on Saturday for Carlson, but I said this in insider inbox. What matters now is not the fact that that happened. What matters now is what happens next. How does yep. how does he bounce back from this? How does he put that behind him? What does he do going forward as the lights are going to continue to get brighter? Because not only will you know his next kicking period, everybody will be watching because of what happened on Saturday when he you know got into a little bit of a rut. But then you know family night, the lights are going to go on. Yep. Then you have the preseason games and everything. There's going to be this progression, and this is a young man. You know he kicked in SEC stadiums in front of ninety, a hundred thousand people and whatnot. But still, this is the NFL. He's trying to win a job. He's trying to you know, prevent the Packers from, uh, from needing to bring in any other kickers. And a lot of eyes are going to be on him here moving forward. Yeah, no doubt about it. And the, the beautiful thing about this, especially the time in which we're taping, this is by the time this actually runs, or you might see it out there in Packers universe land, uh, he might've went six for six. Cause it sounds like he will be kicking again on Tuesday before we tape this. Uh, but it's going to be the ebbs and flows of camp. And as an, as disappointing as I'm sure that was for Anders and everybody, you know, getting on a little bit of that skid on Saturday, it's about how you do respond to it. And it is about making sure that it doesn't compound. You want to build, you don't want to take away. So that that's going to be the major key for him. Pat O'Donnell, you know, the long snappers, that whole operation is, is still moving forward and making progress. And the kid has an incredible leg. We saw it throughout the off season program. Didn't seem like he was striking the ball the same way he was uh, in Monday's or Sunday's Saturday's practice. But keep in mind, again, the, the wind was kind of a, you know, he was going right up into it. So those are the adjustments you have to make though, Mike, we talked about it for years with Mason Crosby, especially after the South end zone expansion. Yeah. It is not easy to kick in Lambeau field. It is a real difficult puzzle to solve sometimes. And, you know, for a guy like Carlson, who I thought struck the ball really well through the off season program, you eventually, there are going to be days when they just don't go in and seeing how the young man bounces back from that and what he takes away from experiences like that are going to be so telling as far as what his future looks like and what the rest of the summer outlook is going to be for the Packers. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we will be back with another show later this week to talk about more observations and musings about practice. But for now, we'll call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team of training camp, everything going on. We've got a ton of content for you on Packers.com. For Wes, I am Mike. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We will see you next time.